Good morning, church. So I was told that today is Youth Sabbath, but since we're all God's children, I think we can all be counted as youth. Amen? Amen. Okay, so for today, the title of the sermon is called Modern Day Israelites. So let's travel back to the land of Canaan, otherwise known as the Promised Land, the land that God had promised the Israelites when he brought them out of slavery in Egypt a land that the Lord described in Exodus 3, verse 8, as a good and spacious land, a land that was flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. But wait a minute. God had, pro had promised someone else's home to the Israelites? Not only that, but a good home flowing with milk and honey. But why would God, a loving God, order the destruction of these nations. Not to mention, these nations were stronger and larger than Israel. But the current, occupant, the current occupants, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, displeased the Lord because they served false gods and they did evil in the sight of the Lord. Because of this, God told the Israelites that he would give the nations totally over to the Israelites. In Deuteronomy 7, 2, verse 6, we read, And when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you, and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them and show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods. This is what you are to do. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their Asherah poles, and burn their idols in the fire. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people. So God's instructions were clear. Destroy the current occupants. Better yet, God had promised to deliver these stronger, larger nations over to the Israelites. Sometimes, we can be quick to forget the, the reality of the Israelites' situation. Although victory was guaranteed by the Lord, I can understand how the Israelites could have been intimidated or misled. If we see here, these were all the nations which, uh, were, in the, which were in the areas where, where God had led the Israelites after bringing them out of Egypt. And we see here the Israelites and how they were surrounded by the nations who worshipped false gods. So do you think it was easy or difficult to, be, to stay away from the influences of the gods if you're in the Israelite situation? Difficult. Yeah, so it was probably very difficult. Um, but, and if we were in the Israelite situation, what steps would you take to ensure that you weren't influenced by the surrounding nations who did not follow God's will? So put yourselves in the Israelites' shoes. What steps would you take if you were surrounded by all these nations who didn't worship the Lord? Don't join them. Okay, that's a good idea. Any other suggestions? Okay, yeah, so don't join them is, is, is a very good idea. But as so, ha as so happens, the Israelites fell into temptation. Perhaps on their way to Sabbath, um, to Sabbath worship, they heard the distant sounds of bells and trumpets and shouts of laughter and games and maybe the sweet smell of roasting pork coming over from the Canaanite tents. And after worship, they went back to their homes and they ate but because sunset was still a ways off, they got a little bit bored. And so perhaps a group of Israelite teenagers told their parents that they were going for a walk. And they were just going to enjoy nature. And then one of them brought up what they were all thinking. Let's, let's just go check out the Canaanite camp. It won't hurt to look. And they did just that. They only looked. Maybe the first time they just looked. But the next Sabbath, they went a little bit closer and closer and closer until before they, know it, they knew it, the guilt wore away and they found themselves joining in with the, Israel, with the Canaanites. 
And in Psalms 106, verse 35 to 40, we read of the Israelites' descent into idolatry. It says, They were mingled among the heathen, and they learned their works, and served their idols, which were a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils, and they shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and of their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. So instead of following God's guidance, where he told the Israelites to destroy the Canaanites, to ensure that they were not misled by the surrounding nations, the Israelites decided to take matters into their own hands, and they decided to mingle with these surrounding nations. They essentially underestimated the power that influence can have, and they conformed to the world. So let's bring this into the 21st century. So as Christians, whether youth or adults, it can be difficult to do what's right despite knowing what we should do. So we Christians are also prone to falling into temptations and indulging in pleasures that don't align with God's will. So this may take the form of maybe watching football games on Sabbath instead of waiting until after Sabbath, or maybe cursing in front of school or workmates in order to fit in. Or maybe we might grab a pint at the local pub with the guys so we don't feel left out. And as a result of falling into temptation, our relationship with God suffers. And we can switch the Israelites with ourselves and the seven nations we can, we can just put in the temptations that we experience in the world today. So we often find ourselves falling into the ways of the world, despite knowing better. So the question is, has God given us an impossible task? After all, the scriptures were written when there was no internet, there were no phones, there were no movies, etc. But isn't God more powerful than these man-made technologies? For us to use these excuses is to give them more power over us than God. The God who made heaven and earth is indeed more powerful than any temptation, and he's able to give us the strength to overcome. And when, and when we are faced with temptation, let us remember that God says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Amen. So your temptation is common to mankind. You're not the only person struggling with a particular sin. So, and often in the church, there might be a spirit of secrecy that makes us feel that we are alone in our struggles and that we're the, we're the only ones who are struggling with certain sins. But don't be discouraged, for the Bible says, no one is perfect, no, not one, Romans 3, verse 10. But though we aren't perfect, we can still find healing and restoration in the Lord, no matter how broken we may be. We can be reassured of this healing in Jeremiah. And it reads, for I will restore health to you, and I will heal you of your wounds, said the Lord. Because they called you an outcast, saying, This is Zion, whom no man seeks after. You might feel trapped in a sin that you think you can't overcome. But God is telling us that he will always provide a way out so that we can endure it. Man may tell you that you are broken beyond repair. But the maker of the earth is telling you that he will heal and restore health to you. Overcoming sin may not be easy. It will likely take willpower and a lot of self-control. But we must lose our lives and our selfish desires and our sinful ways in order to honor Christ. And we can be further encouraged by Bible stories where giving in to the ways of the world would have made life much easier. Take Joseph. He was faced with the temptation of Potiphar's wife. And the result of fleeing from sin and honoring God was a prison sentence. Next, Daniel, he was faced with the choice of praying to King Darius or facing the lions, but he chose to serve God instead of giving in to the temptation of serving King Darius and, and dishonoring God. So both Joseph and, Dave, and Daniel 
were willing to lose their were willing to lose their lives in order to honor God. And Luke 9 verse 24 reads, "For whoever wishes to lose his life, oh sorry, whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it." So what does it mean to lose his life for my sake? It doesn't necessarily mean death. Losing lives means giving up our own desires to please ourselves in exchange for pleasing God. So in losing our new lives in Christ, it's like getting rid of a bag of rubbish that we've been holding onto in exchange for a bag of gold. But funnily enough, we often find ourselves reluctant to get rid of this bag of rubbish because some of us have gotten so used to the stench of the rubbish that we don't even recognize that we're holding it. And it is only when we choose to leave our old lives behind and seek the reward in Christ that we can recognize the sin that we have been dwelling in and begin anew. And Christ is willing to take the rubbish from us. He tells us, come to me, all ye who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and I will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So the Bible tells us that the, sacri- that the reward for sacrificing our desires for God's is fullness of life. But how can we trust that we will receive fullness in God? How do we know that he actually has our best interests at heart? So does God exhibit the characteristics that we look for in a friend? And is he someone that we can love, that we can trust to love and care for us? So I gathered some characteristics that I think most of us look for in a friend. And I wanted to see if, okay, does God also display these characteristics? So first, kindness. In an outburst of anger, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting loving kindness, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Okay, so he does display kindness. Next, forgiving. They refused to listen, and they did not remember your wondrous deeds when you had performed among them. So they became stubborn and appointed a leader in return to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God of forgiveness, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, and you did not forsake them. Okay, so we see that even when we wrong God, he's definitely willing to forgive us. So that's another check. So next, patience. But he, being compassionate, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. And often he restrained his anger and did not arouse all his wrath. Okay, so we see that God also displays patience towards us. And finally, also honesty. So in the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. Okay, so we we know that he also displays honesty. And then lastly, another trait we look for in a friend is, does a friend have good thoughts towards us? For I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Okay, so given all of this evidence, I think we can come to the conclusion that God is indeed trustworthy and that God is someone who who we would want to have for a friend. Amen? Okay, so now that we hopefully agree that God is trustworthy and a friend, what can we expect a new life in Christ to look like? So is it a life that we should even desire to have or are we better off just staying in our current conditions? In order to answer this question, let's just do a cost-benefit analysis. We can look at what each side offers. We can look at what a life without Christ offers and a life with Christ. Okay, so we don't have to read the whole verse, but just pay attention to the red, to the red writing. So now the works of the flesh are evident. So we find sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, And the list goes on. And more so, people who are without God will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, and unholy, and without love. 
So from, from, from these characteristics described for life without Christ, it looks like there are many negative costs which are associated with it. And I tried to find benefits, but I couldn't really find any benefits. Um, if anyone can think of any, let me know. So next, I wanted to look at what a life in Christ would look, would look like. Okay, so here we see the, righteous, the righteousness of the blameless will smooth his way, and the righteousness of the upright will deliver them. So here we see that our path is guided when we have a life in Christ. Next, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So already we can see that a lot of the characteristics which come with a life in Christ are definitely more positive than those that we saw for a life without Christ. And finally, he will also renew our strength and give us wings like eagles and help us to run and not grow weary. And finally, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Which means that there's definitely hope for people who have lived a life without Christ. And he is willing to just give us a new life and forget about the, about the old things. So the cost of following God, there's definitely a cost involved. And that cost is giving up our old lives for a new life in Christ. But the benefits are innumerable. Not only do we receive new life, but we also get love and peace and hope and strength and protection and self-control. And the list goes on and on. So from the biblical evidence presented, I hope we can agree that a life in Christ is more pleasant than a life apart from Christ. But sometimes, when we've strayed from God, it can be hard to imagine that he will welcome us back. In rejecting God's will, we have denied Christ and we've barred him from having authority in our lives. Now, we aren't alone in our denial. If we turn to Luke 22, we read about Peter. Just having witnessed Jesus being dragged away, he was following close behind far enough that he won't be associated with Jesus, but close enough to still keep an eye on him. But Peter isn't as disguised as he thinks, and a curious servant girl approaches him and says, this man also was with him. But Peter denies it and says, woman, I do not know him. When we choose to indulge in sin as Christians, we're also saying, world, I do not know Jesus. And when we see, and next we see that Peter went on to deny Jesus two more times that hour. We read in verses 58 to 60. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, you, you were also one of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. So three times, Peter denied his Savior. The same Jesus that Peter had witnessed performing miracles, healing the sick, and bringing the dead back to life. Peter knew that Jesus was legitimate, the Son of God, and yet he still denied Christ. But instead of giving up in his sin and deciding that he was no longer fit to serve Jesus, Peter recognized his sin and it pained him. And in verse 62, we read, he went out and wept bitterly. But something wonderful had actually occurred before all of this. Jesus had foreseen Peter's denial, and he had also predicted his victory over it. In Luke 22, verse 32, we read, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fall. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Here, Jesus knew that Peter would turn his back to him, but he also knew that Peter would return to him. And though having denied him before, he would serve as a source of strength for his brothers. So isn't it wonderful to see that our Jesus does not hold our past against us? And though maybe we might have denied him in our sin, he still welcomes us back, and he positions us as a source of strength for our struggling brothers. Amen. So brothers and sisters, despite our actions, 
And despite maybe straying into the world like the Israelites and maybe denying Christ like Peter, our futures, if we so choose, are bright. And in Isaiah 43, we read, Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So we serve a wonderful, forgiving God who is willing to make us new despite our past. Amen. So shall we please stand in prayer as we give thanks to God for his mercy and pray for the strength to deny the world and follow Christ. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given us. And we thank you, Lord, for your willingness to turn our lives around and for being willing to welcome us back to what we've done in the past. And I pray that you can also give us the strength to turn away from fulfilling our own desires, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <laughs>